Hello out there in YouTube land. I'm uh, going to do a little video, a uh, little short Bible study. I expect this to take only, let's say, five to ten minutes at the most. This is a subject that probably many people are not even concerned about. But if you are dispensational in your theology, this will sh uh, show you some verses to teach that the body of Christ was indeed present before Paul got saved. From what I understand, some of these mid ex dispensationalists teach that Paul was the first member of the body. But we're going to look at some verses that seem to teach otherwise, and then you can judge for yourselves. So we're going to start out with a verse that's very popular about the Church of God. It's Acts 20.28. 20, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I think you can see that there on the screen. So God purchased the church of God with his own blood. This obviously is not talking about a local church, because local churches were not purchased with the blood of Christ, but it's the body of Christ the church which is his body that was purchased by the blood of Christ. This is just foundation. But anyway, uh, then you've got another verse here in the 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Now oh, that's a local church. But in Acts 20, 28, that can't be referring to a local church. It says, The church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. That's the, the whole body. And then we go to... Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.32, it says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So the whole group of humanity is divided into three groups of people, Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God, or believers, or those that are members of the body of Christ. So again, it's not a local church in this passage it's a universal division of all humanity. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God. So based on that, the Church of God being, uh, it could be a local church, but it also refers to the body of Christ. So we read in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 verse 9, Paul said, for I am the least of the apostles, let me read this. For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul, talking about what he did before he became converted, and that was that he per persecuted the church of God. Another verse here. Uh, this is in Galatians 1.13. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Another verse saying that he, before he was a believer, he persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So, the church of God was purchased with the blood of Christ. The Church of God is one of the major divisions of all humanity, Jew, Gentile, and Church of God. And Paul was persecuting the Church of God before he was saved. So who was he persecuting? He was persecuting the body of Christ. But we'll put a couple more proofs forth if you're not convinced by that simple argument. Let's go to the next point. And the next point is, the people that Paul was persecuting before he became saved were believers, and they actually had the same faith that he had. So this is um, Galatians 1.22. It says, And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, get this, which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. 
So Paul was preaching the faith that he once destroyed. So there's here's here's another verse. I, I don't know exactly the reference on this one, but um, he said, And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. So he was persecuting people that had believed on Jesus. And the verse before that I just read said that he was now preaching the faith which once he destroyed. So my point it is this. From what I gather, the hyper or the dispensational, what, we, what Ruckman would call hyper dispensationalists, are teaching that up until Paul's conversion and the revelation of the mystery, that they were preaching the kingdom gospel. And they make a distinction that the kingdom gospel has some kind of element of works in it. For example, water baptism, necessary for salvation. What else they believe, I don't know. But Paul said very clearly that he was preaching the faith, not the faith in works. He was preaching the faith that he once destroyed. I mean, Paul didn't say that, but they said it about him. And then it says that he imprisoned and beat those that believed in Jesus. Does that sound like the kingdom gospel? We'll look into that a little bit a little bit more later. But let's move on to the next proof. The next proof is that when Paul was persecuting the believers, Jesus told him that he was persecuting him. He was persecuting Jesus. This is in Acts chapter... Um, actually, I don't have the reference written down for this, but he fell unto the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? That's Jesus talking to Saul, and he's asking Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who was Paul persecuting? He was persecuting the believers in Jesus. But, this is my logic here, because they were members of the body, Jesus could say that he was persecuting him. He was persecuting Jesus by persecuting the believers in Jesus. Because they were part of the church of God, and they were in Christ, says the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, and therefore they were persecuting the body of Christ. And that's how they were persecuting Jesus, by persecuting the believers. Uh, the next verse is very similar. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. So again, it's when Paul was persecuting the believers, Jesus said, you're persecuting me, Paul. Because he was persecuting the church of God and wasting it. And he was persecuting people that, that, that believed in Jesus. And Jesus himself said he was persecuting Jesus because they were members of his body. Now these people also say that, you know, that Paul was the first member of the body. Well, this next verse says this. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. They were in Christ before me. So he was not the first member of Christ, the body of Christ. I mean, of course, you know, if you want to tiptoe through the tulips and dodge the bullets... You're going to find a way to justify your beliefs. I know that's the way it goes, you know. Very rarely you're going to find somebody that's going to repent, especially somebody who is 
thinks that they are so knowledgeable in the scriptures. But I don't know how they explain all this, honestly, without doing some... I mean, I've heard it explained that there's two bodies. That there's, I don't know. I don't think the Bible teaches that. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. It says you're all, by one spirit, are you all baptized into one body? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And the fact that he was persecuting the, not a, the church of God. And that Jesus purchased the church of God with his own blood. And they were believers in Jesus and they were saved by faith. They were saved by faith. Um, it's pretty clear to me, if you add all this stuff together, that the body of Christ was present before Paul got saved. And um, I believe in Ephesians, if you look, that it says that the body, who, he reconciled us into one body by the cross. So who's to say that the body didn't start at the cross? That's when the New Testament started. At the death of the testator. So even the thief on the cross that died next to Jesus, technically he died in the New Testament. And uh, so that so did they die in the New Testament in the early part of the book of Acts. And uh, even in Acts chapter 1, they asked Jesus, Will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath in his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and out of, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So it sounds like a change is already being made in Acts chapter 1. I mean, in, in the Gospels, they're saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. Or it's right here, and if you'll receive your Messiah, it will come. But after the crucifixion and the resurrection, they asked Jesus, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus doesn't say, Yeah, it's at hand. If you just receive Christ, it'll come. He says, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. He says, But you, which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. It sounds to me like he's telling them, don't worry about that right now. Get busy preaching the gospel. And just to add a few things on here, if you read Acts 15, Peter rehearses how that the Lord, through him, Preach the gospel unto the Gentiles. I might take a minute to find that right here. Uh, if I can, I'm on my phone and it might not be easy to do all this while I'm making a video. But I think I can do it. Just give me a second here. I'm going to get to Acts chapter 15. And I'm going to look up uh, what Peter was saying there. Acts chapter 15 starting around like verse 8 maybe. Uh, here's Peter saying. This is Peter. I'll start in verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know that how a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Peter's saying, God chose me to give the gospel to the Gentiles. And that happened in Acts chapter 10 when he was he was called by uh, where Cornelius had a vision when he was praying and he sent to Joppa and then they brought Peter back to Cornelius' house and he told him words by where he and all his household should be saved. And um, Peter says he preached the word of the gospel and that they believed it. And it says, and God, starting in Acts 15, 8, and God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, 
talking about between Jews and Gentiles, Peter being a Jew and Cornelius being a Gentile, and put no difference between us, Jews, and them, Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. I'll keep reading. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Talking about the law. But we believe, Acts 15, 11, Peter speaking still, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So this is Peter, supposedly the one who has a different gospel and it only goes to the Jews. But here it says that they, he, they heard the word of the gospel, they believed it, they were saved by faith, their, their hearts were purified by faith and that they were saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as, even as Paul was, I mean, Peter was. So, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's really tiring to be honest. I mean, I, I was taught by one of the best, Dr. Rockman. I mean, and it's not an easy subject. But, you know, and this is where I learned most of this stuff, but not all of it. Some of them reading the Bible for myself, you know. And, um, I mean, the stuff's clear. He, he, Paul was persecuting, I mean, Peter was persecuting the church of God and wasting it. He was persecuting Jesus by persecuting the believers in Jesus because they were part of the body. And there were people in Christ before him. Not just those two people that he named, Andronicus and Junius, but also it says the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Those local churches in Judea, the Bible says they were in Christ. So, like Dr. Ruckman says, something can be there before it's revealed. I'm sure you all know of this simple illustration he would do. He would put, he had some coins in his pocket and he says, how many coins do I have in my pocket? And, you know, you say, well, I don't know because I can't see them. And then he takes them out and shows them to you. And he says, they were there all the time. You just couldn't see them. They weren't revealed, but they were there. And uh, so it's, I think he had it right. And I don't think there's really a good answer for these verses. Of course, I mean, these these hyper dispensationalists, and I, I don't say that with a lot of vitriol. I actually listen to some of them. I mean, they do have truth. A lot of them are King James Bible believers. And, you know, it's interesting, a lot of the stuff they have to say. But the main reason I'm putting this video out there is, you know, they totally nullify water baptism for this age. And, you know, they, they make this big deal about the fact that Peter and Paul are preaching a different gospel. That Peter has a the gospel of the circumcision and Paul is the gospel of the Gentiles. But if you read in Galatians, there's a parenthesis right after that. I mean, in, um, I think that's in, I think it's in Galatians. Yeah. Where he says <laughs> that Paul has the gospel of the circumcision and Peter, or Paul's the gospel of the uncircumcision. Peter has the gospel of the circumcision. The verse right after it says, Paul went to the Jews and Peter, Paul went to the Gentiles and Peter went to the Jews. Boy, I'm getting all this mixed up. Like my pastor says, don't listen to what I'm saying, listen to what I mean. But it wasn't two different Gospels. It was just the fact that Paul's main ministry was to Gentiles and that Peter's main ministry was to Jews. They had the same Gospel in Acts 15. Peter confirmed that Paul's Gospel of Grace was correct. That's what I just read you in Acts 15. And Peter's referring back to Acts 10. And Peter was the one who first preached the gospel to the Gentiles, not Paul. And Paul also went to Jews in his ministry. And he also had signs and wonders to Gentiles, if you read in Romans. He said through mighty signs and wonders, he made the Gentiles obedient. Man, when he went to that island, he healed Publius' uh, father-in-law or father or whatever. I mean, he, he did miracles to the Gentiles. I mean, that's, it gets oversimplified, it gets overdivided. Ruckman teaches that it's a transition book, Acts. 
You can't cut it thin and 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 exact. There's going to be overlap, and that's what's going on. It's it's a gradual, uh, gradual transition. And I'm no scholar. I'm just putting in my two cents here. But I think I've made a good point with what I've said. And um, there's more I want to say. I, here's another thing that came up with a friend of mine that I pray with on the phone. There's people out there that are teaching that Romans chapter 10 is not church age salvation doctrine. They say that Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a parenthesis dealing with Israel. I, I see that part. I believe that. Okay, I can see that. But if you read Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Paul says there is only one gospel for Jews and Greeks, and it's the gospel of Christ. And in Romans 10, yeah, maybe he's primarily talking to a Jewish audience through this, this gospel to the Romans, which doesn't make too much sense, to be honest, but okay, it's a parenthesis. I, I can accept that, but read the chapter. It says in Romans 1, Paul says, my heart's, de uh, uh, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he says, well, that's just talking about saved from their enemies, you know. But it doesn't say that. It says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going up, us about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You're saved by faith, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. There's only one gospel. Paul would not tolerate another gospel. He said in, in Galatians, if though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said, I wish that they would be cut off that are preaching this false gospel of works. Cut off. He, he, he wishes they were dead. Okay, Paul was not tolerating Peter preaching another gospel. In fact, Paul in the book of Galatians was rebuking Peter because Peter had fallen away from the, the truths of the gospel and he was separating himself from the Gentiles and, and because of the fear of man. He was not preaching a different gospel. It's only that he had a different group that he primarily ministered, ministered to. Paul, Paul was to the Gentiles and Peter was to the Jews with the same gospel. I can admit in early part of the book of Acts, like Acts chapter 2, it sounds like water baptism is part of the message there. He says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It sounds like receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is dependent on water baptism. I'm not denying that, but it's a transition. And it doesn't mean that people that were believing that message and getting baptized in water were not being put into the body. Because the people that Paul was persecuting were believers in Christ. They were, they were identified so much with Christ that when Paul was persecuting them, Jesus said he was persecuting himself. He was persecuting Jesus. Why persecutest thou me, he said to Paul, Jesus said. And there was people in Christ before Paul very clearly. Now, if you're going to say in Christ, does it mean in the body of Christ? What about the church of God? There's, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Paul was not persecuting Jews. He was not persecuting Gentiles. He was persecuting the church of God. Believers. And he was, the people said of him that he now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. His message that he was preaching was, a, was so close to the message that they were preaching in the other part, part of Acts that it says he's preaching the same faith. Obviously, there's stuff that had to be worked out. And you know, God revealed something to Peter on the spot. He gave Peter a vision. 
with all those unclean animals let down in a, a, a sheet. That's when Peter got his revelation to go to the Gentiles in that vision. God said, what God hath cleansed, not thou, call not thou common, or uh, uh, call not thou unclean, common. And that's how Peter had the, the, he was convicted by the Holy Ghost that he needed to go to this Gentile named Cornelius and, and, and give the gospel to him. And later when he uh, recited it in Acts 15, he said that they heard the word of the gospel and believed and that, that their hearts were purified by faith and that, um, oh, my mind's slipping now. It's ain't easy for me. <laughs> and that, uh, that they shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as we are, he said. I hope this will help somebody. I mean, I know I'm in thin water. Most Christians are not interested in this kind of stuff. But that's like Dr. Ruckman talked about when I went to school there. He says, most Baptists don't know enough Bible to get messed up in hyper-dispensationalism. That's the danger. He taught dispensationalism, but he still believed in water baptism. He still believed that the body of Christ was present in the early part of Acts, even though they didn't know about it. And those are the main differences that I see. Um, and besides the fact is, like when someone's trying to take verses away from Romans chapter 10, here's what, here was, here's what they're saying. You can't, they, they get, they don't want to, he gets, they get in trouble because they're writing gospel tracts without a sinner's prayer in them. Because all people have to do is hear the gospel and believe it, which is true. Okay, that's true. But there's different words in the Bible that God uses besides believe. For example, trust in Christ. For example, many turned unto the Lord. Uh, Jesus said, come unto me. Him that cometh to me, I will know as cast out. So to try and like isolate the gospel to one specific word believe you know what i i believe this i believe roman i mean even if they're right and romans 10 is for jewish people doesn't make any difference at all because paul said there's only one gospel of christ to the jews and to the greeks and it's to those that believe for i'm not ashamed of the gospel of christ romans chapter 1 for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And not two Gospels. And even if Romans 10 is dispensational, I mean, this is ridiculous. The two things I don't like about the chapter from the guy I talked to is calling upon the name of the Lord and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. I'm pretty sure, like, I know from my side, I believe it's the heart belief that saves you, but belief is more than just facts. It's a decision. So if telling someone to call upon the name of the Lord will get them to the point of making a decision to receive Christ, that's another word, receive Christ, John 1, 12. I'm sure they discount that one. Oh, I don't know. I mean, this is what I'm saying. It's, it's really getting, like, not only are they just saying only the Pauline epistles, or some of the Pauline epistles, but now they're saying even Romans 10, which is, you know, for the obedience of faith to all nations, it says in the last part of that book. Now they're trying to take Romans 10 out is not applying to Gentiles. When there's only one gospel to Jews and Gentiles, Paul said in this age. It's not two gospels. Paul very clearly refuted all that in Galatians. He said, I wish they were cut off. He said, uh, they're cursed if they preach another gospel in this age. All right, I put in my two cents. I don't know why. Why am I doing this? I guess it's because I need attention. <laughs> Probably that's what it is. But anyway, it is the truth of the Bible. I thought maybe I could help somebody with this. And I realize, like, it's probably not going to get many views. But I'll try to put a title on it that hopefully might attract some people that would be interested in this kind of subject and maybe they'll get something out of it. I went a lot longer than five or ten minutes, so I do apologize for that. And uh, thank you for watching and have a blessed day. And uh, don't give up. These are hard times. It's hard to be encouraged in these days. And so 
a couple of verses about that. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And another verse, it says, uh, Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Maybe you don't have a high position in a church. Maybe you don't have a recognized church ministry. Maybe you're sort of just what you feel forgotten. But you're not going to be rewarded according to the position you have necessarily. It says you're going to be recorded, rewarded according to your own labor. So find a ministry. For one thing, soul winning, passing out tracts, getting the gospel out. You don't. You you can do that. I mean, I'm a. I do belong to a church, but I'm just saying. It doesn't have to necessarily be a church-sanctioned ministry. It's something you can do on your own. Just buy some gospel tracts and pass them out, or get a street preaching sign and preach the gospel on the streets. There's a lot of ways that you can abound in the work of the Lord because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I mean, it's just it can be discouraging. So uh, I'm not trying to discourage anyone through this video. I'm just trying to stand for some truths that I find. And, and I don't like it when my Bible starts getting like less and less and less. You know, I, I understand right division and the, the, you know, that's a principle of studying the Bible. But in my opinion, they, they've gone overboard in some of these, some of these hyper dispensationalist guys. And they're brilliant. Some of these guys are brilliant. I've seen some guys on the Internet. I'm like, this guy's really sharp, you know really sharp and they they can i told my friend i said you know what no matter what kind of argument i give they're probably going to talk their way around it so it's probably not to help like some guy who's a leader in the hyper dispensationalist movement or the what they call the mid x uh, uh movement or mid, mid x rightly dividing the word movement or whatever they call it you know those guys are pretty much they got their group they got their following but there might be someone gets going to get dragged into it that maybe if they watch this video it might make them think. So, like I said, m most of this stuff I did not come up with on my own. You know, I got most of this from listening to other people. Maybe a few things uh, I've, I got on my own. And it's not new. Other people have gotten it too. But I just wanted to put out, put out something on the internet today. Some kind of video. And this is something that has been on my mind. Uh, partially because I listen to some of these guys on the internet, so I I, I, I see what's going on, and, and it, it actually became a problem between me and a prayer partner. We got a prayer group, a phone prayer group, and uh, this guy brought this up that that he was that one of his friends was being persecuted at his at his church because he didn't want to put a sinner's prayer in his gospel tracts, and I guess the church wanted a sinner's prayer in his gospel tracts in order to use them for the church. Honestly, I don't see anything wrong with it. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that kind of call upon him. And it's not just talking about some kind of temporal salvation of Israel from their enemies. It's talking about the righteousness of God versus their own righteousness. It's talking about preaching the gospel and believing it it says in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's talking about faith. And uh, it says, uh, uh, They have not all, all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? It's talking about the gospel. It says in Romans 10, uh, 14 and 15, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. That's Paul's gospel. It might be another name, the gospel of peace. It's the same gospel. Paul said there's only one gospel that saves in Romans 1. The gospel of Christ to the Jews and to the Greeks. To everyone that believeth. So people go out and preach the gospel of peace. They're first they're sent. Then they go out and preach it. Then people hear it. And if they believe what they're hearing, 
then they're admonished to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved and to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart. I'm not, I know there's people out there that say you have to say a sinner's prayer to be saved. I did not. I just believed what the guy told me. So I did not come, nothing came out of my mouth when I got saved. They, they tried to bring me through a Romans road later and make me say a sinner's prayer because that's the way they were used to doing it. And I felt sort of foolish doing it because honestly I knew something had happened to me. I knew that, that I had been born again. His spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I mean, I had that, I had peace that, that day. Something happened to me. I knew it. I knew my life was never going to be the same. I had power to do stuff. I had power to live. And uh, so it's like, okay, don't don't get so extreme. God puts different verses in there probably to help different people do the same thing. To trust Christ, to believe in Christ, to come to Christ, to rely upon Christ, you know, to be converted, to be saved. I mean, it, it all works together. It's all teaching the same thing. Nothing wrong with, like, discerning, trying to make differences. But I think in this case, they're way out of bounds. Romans 10 has nothing to do with Israel being saved from their temporal enemies. It's talking about the righteousness of God and salvation of the soul by believing the gospel, by preachers that are preaching the gospel, that are sent, that are preaching it, they're hearing it, they're believing it, they're calling upon the name of the Lord, and they're being saved. And the whole book of Romans, is the main, the main theme of the book of Romans is justification by faith, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. And that's what Romans 10 is about. Even if it's talking to Israel about this, the true salvation of God, then it's the same message because there's only one gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles. God bless. Thank you.